Well, thank you. It's uh, good to be back uh, with you all. Uh, I had a great time of worship in the first service, and it's been wonderful uh, to worship you, uh, worship with you uh, this morning. Hey, I, I got to tell you, it's fun to come back and to to see people that I've seen before, to see how uh, people are growing and the, the congregation is growing, and so it's wonderful to see uh, all that God is doing. Uh, I look forward to just hopefully just continuing on our worship, that you would find yourself growing and being challenged and encouraged by the Holy Spirit uh, as we open up God's Word. It was not long after the Berlin Wall came down, uh, my wife Susan and I were traveling with my parents in uh, Germany, the eastern part of Germany. Uh, that, so we were in this former East Germany area. We were in a train car that was really, really old. It had these little compartments where we would sit, and, uh, uh, and then there was, outside the compartments was a hallway. It's a really narrow, narrow hallway that ran the length of the, of the train car. And some of you might have been in something like that uh, one time. And so here I am uh, with my wife and my parents traveling in Europe. I got to let you know two things before I go on with the story about my traveling with my parents. First of all, my parents don't travel, or my parents travel by only an idea and not a plan, okay? Only an idea, not a plan. They, it's not like they have a plan like, here, we're going to go there, and we're going to stay at this hotel, we're going to get there at this time, and then we're going to do... The, no, no, it was that idea. We're going to go to Germany and go to Berlin, and I don't know how long we'll stay there. That kind of experience, all right? So here we are on this train. We don't know... We kind of know where we're going, sort of, but not really. We don't know what we're going to do when we get there. We just have an idea, all right? So on, that's the first thing. Second thing is this. Traveling with my parents, my parents don't travel light, all right? <coughs> you know what that means. Travel light. Uh, here, Susan and I, my wife, we had, a one, we had one bag for both of us. They had four, all right? So they had four suitcases. Here we are in this little compartment, narrow hallway, and uh, we're sitting there on this train with all this luggage, an idea in our mind, and that's about it. We started, we pulled into a train station and uh, this all of a sudden, my dad kind of stood up and said, this is our stop. So uh, again, idea, not a plan. We didn't really, uh, it caught us by surprise. So we quickly formed an assembly line to get the luggage out of the train and onto the platform. And so my wife is on the platform. She's kind of receiving the luggage off the train. She gets about three bags off the train. We still have two bags plus three of us still on the train. All of a sudden the whistle blows, the door closes. And, you know, and she's caught there on the platform. What do I do? So she goes, this is what she does. She goes, halt, halt. And which, you know, again, halt is a good term because I mean, stop. But the hand signal was not necessarily a good term. And a good thing. Well, thankfully, after, you know, doing that a few times, the train stops, opens the door. We just kind of pour out with our luggage onto the platform. Our hearts are beating really fast because, you know, here we were going to go on and Susan would have been stuck on the platform with three pieces. We were so excited that we got off the train. And as we were catching our breath and looked and saw the train disappear out of the train station, guess what we realized? It was the wrong stop. Yes, exactly. We got off one stop too soon. And, uh, and uh, so we had to board the train. Like we had to get, wait for the next one and pour all our stuff on, do it all again. So... You know what I find is in life, we do the same thing. We sometimes get off uh, God's plan one step too early. You know, we, we, we get off on this idea of God's love one stop too early. For example, I, I do believe most of us understand that God loves us. We have seen John three sixteen plastered, you know, at least the, the guy at the football stadium holding the sign. We know John 3, many of you know it by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And we say, thank you, God. We love you. We love that you love us. And so we have salvation and we have eternal life. That's great. It's one stop too early. It really is because what about this life? What does it mean to experience God's love now? What does it look like for us to live in that? And I think one of the things that I would like to encourage you with this morning is the real realization that in God's love, we have security in God's love, we have security. As we journey this life, 
we journey in security. And a great psalm that I would like us to focus in on is Psalm 125. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. The words uh, should be up on the screen. If you want to use the Pew Bible or the Bible in front of you, it's uh, page 967. Now let me give you, while you're finding that, let me give you a little bit of background uh, to this psalm so that you kind of know what's going on with this psalm. This psalm is part of a collection, a small collection of 15 psalms. Psalm 120, it starts at 120 and it goes to 130. Okay, it's like a little songbook, or for those that don't know what a songbook is, it's like a, it's like a CD of songs, worship songs, all put together in one. But it's only 15, okay? Now, you know, many of you know that there's like a lot of psalms in the book of Psalms. And so this is just one little slice. And these, this collection is actually called Songs of Ascent. Now, I used to not know what that meant. I thought it was kind of strange. What does that all mean? I came to discover basically what is happening is that this collection of psalms were given, were written so that the Hebrew people, when they would pilgrimage to Jerusalem, they would sing these songs on their way to Jerusalem. And if you were a good Hebrew, you would go to Jerusalem three times a year for the three big festivals. Okay? So here they are, they're on a journey. Now, where does this... Where's the idea of ascent come in? Well, Jerusalem is one of the highest cities in Palestine. And so if they were, wherever they were, they were in some way, in form and fashion, they were ascending to Jerusalem. So as they're journeying up on a slow descent, hopefully, I, I don't know if we could all make it. I, I hope I would. I, I don't know if I would. But if I was journeying up to Jerusalem, that I would be singing these songs to the Lord. Now, it's not just an idea of a literal ascent. There's also a symbolic or a metaphor of this ascent. It's this idea that we are on a trip to Jerusalem. Basically, we are moving upward towards God. Because God, in that time, lived in Jerusalem. He dwelled in Jerusalem. And so they would go to Jerusalem to meet with him. And so they were moving upward to him. So that's the background to this psalm. This psalm is, is really one that, that is a journey song. So I want you to imagine as we go through it that we are singing the song together, okay? So Psalm 125, starting verse one, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. Let me just stop there. There are two quick pictures that the psalmist gives us about those who trust in the Lord, those who have full confidence in God. And the first picture is this. They are like Mount Zion. Now, for most of us, we'd go, oh, okay, I'm like a mountain. What does that mean? Well, Mount Zion is the central part, the center part of Jerusalem. It is where the where the temple was built. It's the Temple Mount. That's where God resides, in the Temple Mount. And so when the psalmist says, those who trust in the Lord are like the Temple Mount, Mount Zion, where God dwells, and it cannot be shaken. It cannot be moved. It will last forever. The idea that Mount Zion could be moved, moved from over here to over on this other mountain, was unheard of. It was absurd. Impossible. So the psalmist is saying, those of us who have confidence, full confidence in God, are like Mount Zion, where God dwells, that cannot be moved. We will not be shaken. And that will last forever. On top of that, in verse 2, he gives us a second picture. This second picture, the worshipers are reminded not just of how impressive Jerusalem is, how impressive Mount Zion is, but how wonderfully protected it is. See, Jerusalem, though it's uh, one of the, the highest cities in Palestine, is not the highest point. See, it's surrounded by mountains. Jerusalem is surrounded by mountains. I had the privilege of being in Israel last summer and standing on Mount Olive, which is just across from Jerusalem. And Mount Olive, you just, you sometimes don't even realize it, but you, when you're at the top of Mount Olive, you're actually looking down on Mount Zion, the, the Temple Mount. 
And so it, Jerusalem, though it's not the highest point, is surrounded by these mountains. And the psalmist says, just like these mountains protect Jerusalem, so God does. It's this image of God's arms coming around his people, showing care and love and security. When I see that, and I, that picture in my head, I often think of my daughter, Phoebe. Uh, she's 20 now, but I still think of her as my little Phoebe. And she used to come in, and I used to wrap my arms around her and give her a big squeeze and hold her and tell her I love her. I still do that, even though she kind of squirms a little bit. But I will just come up, and I wrap my arm around her. And I just hope. And I believe that when I do that, she knows I care and that I'm there to protect her and hold her tight. That's the image here. That those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion that cannot be shaken. And they are wrapped by God's loves just as the mountains wrap Jerusalem and protect Jerusalem. Now, the psalmist doesn't stop there. That's a great thing about this psalm. He doesn't just stop and say, great, now let's go. No, he goes on and he says, you know what? There's real life. There's real life that we have to deal with. And so in verse three, that's what he begins to do, uh, address. He says this, the scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. For then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. What the psalmist is saying is, listen, evil still exists. And in fact, he uses the term scepter of the wicked, meaning rule of the wicked. Uh, most scholars believe that this psalm was written after the Israelites come back out of exile from the land of Babylon and Persia. They come back to, to the Holy Land. They come back to the Promised Land. And they're still under the rule of Persia. They're still under the rule of a foreign government. They're be, still being oppressed. And the psalmist says, guess what? We still are under that scepter of the wicked. But, he says, but, and this is the key word, it will not remain. It will not remain. He's giving hope to the people. He's helping them see that evil does not last. And he says, if it did, maybe some of us would resort to evil and take things into our own hands if, that's what, if that continued. Let's go on to verse four. From verse four to five, the psalmist moves from kind of the people and telling and reminding the people, he moves to a prayer. A prayer to God and he says, Lord, do good to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with evildoers, peace be on Israel. What the psalmist is really saying is, God, answer our prayers. Do good to those who are good. And how, do, how does he define good? Those who have upright hearts. See, he's not addressing those who do the right things, who look good on the outside. He's saying really, those who are good are those who have upright hearts. He says, and banish those, and I think he's alluding back towards the evil rulers, banish those who have crooked ways, meaning they, haven't had, they don't have a straight path to God, they have taken their own path, and it looks like this, <laughs> all right? And he says, banish them from the land. And then he concludes and he says, peace beyond Israel. It's kind of like what Jesus says in John chapter 14 when he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid because God's peace is with us. Well, that's what the psalmist says. That's what it means to have security in God's love. And what I want to do is just give you some practical things real quick four practical things about what it means to, to journey in this security of God's love that comes from this psalm. And the first thing is this. We need to examine our foundation. Examine our foundation. What or who is your foundation of security? I know most of us know the answer is to be God. 
But in reality, we live as if our security is in something else or someone else. I had the privilege of, of serving a couple weeks ago at our church's high school and middle school camp. I love teenagers. I, I've worked with teenagers since I was a teenager. <laughs> you know, I was, I was 18 years old teaching middle school, Sunday school, you know, and I, I, so I've worked with teenagers a long time. I love teenagers, but one of the things uh, I know I was like, and I saw it, and I was reminded again, I was reminded of how high school kids, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure out who we are and find, trying to figure out um, how to deal with our own insecurities and to have security. And one of the things about high school guys that I noticed at this camp, at least, not saying anything about the, any high school kids here, okay, but uh, is that uh, they, they will say things and do things to be cool so they can be liked and therefore be secure in the fact that they're liked, okay? And uh, I mean, crazy weird things that they would say and do in the, in the cabin, you know, with each other, jumping off things and jumping around. It was just crazy. But you know what? It's not just teenagers that are like that. We're like that. Adults are like that too. Adults, we have insecurities, don't we? And we look for security in things and others. And I'm just going to confess in my life, over my years of adulthood, I've tried to find security in having people like me. Just everybody like me. I, I don't know about you, but have, does anybody remember the cartoon series called Recess? My kids were, anyone? No. <laughs> wow, okay, well, forget that one. No, uh, my, my, when my kids were young, we, they would watch this cartoon. Of course, that means I'm watching it as well. And it's recess. It's about these fifth graders who, um, there's a gang of them, and there's one guy that's kind of the head of the, this little group. And uh, this one little, this guy, his, it bothered, and one episode came where it, there was this one kid that would not like him. And it bothered him. He did everything to try to get this kid to like him. Everything, the whole episode was that. And finally, the, the kid just says, I, it's nothing you, or I just decided I don't like you. That's all. And that was the end of it. I'm like that little kid, that kid that was running around. I've been like that. I've been like that, trying to make people like me. And you know what? It doesn't always work. And I find myself seeking security in that. Maybe you have a different vice when it comes to security and it might be you find security in your job. Maybe you find security in your relationships. Maybe you find security in the things that you possess or in your investments and whatever it might be. I think one of the things that I would say to you is that we come to the psalm. The psalm is that rec recognizing that people are spending this time going to Jerusalem and they're spending time reflecting on the fact that God is their security, but really where is their security in life? What is your foundation for security? To journey in security of God's love, it means that we need to regularly examine our foundation. What truly is that foundation that we're building our security on? Hopefully, we can move more and more where our security rests solely on God, our trust in Him. Now, the second, let me give you a second thing about about uh, living in security. Security requires surrender. Security re requires surrender. See, the people were leaving behind their life for a time. They were leaving behind their homes. They were leaving behind stuff and to go on this pilgrimage to Jerusalem and to spend this time in Jerusalem in the festival. It was a time of leaving something and moving towards God. We need to surrender. Security re requires us to surrender. But what do we need to surrender? I think some of us find ourselves in need of surrendering our illusion to control uh, or of control. I, I think we have, I, I call it an illusion because in reality, we're not in control. But we think we are, right? H have you ever thought that you were in control? Some of us think we're in control of our own destiny, you know, master of our own destiny kind of deal. I, I don't think we are. God's in control, but we think we're in control. Even Jesus said, I'm not in control. I'll do whatever the Father tells me. 
And so he prays, your will be done on earth, not mine. Maybe we're afraid that if we surrender our illusion to control, God will make us do something we don't want to do. But we've got to surrender our illusion of control. We've got to do that. I think we need to surrender our circumstances. Surrender our circumstances. Now, we recognize that in life, our circumstances aren't always gardens with roses and sunshine. We recognize that our circumstances are, are, are filled with pain and hardship at times. And I'm, when I say surrender our circumstances, I'm not saying deny how bad and how painful those circumstances are. But we need to surrender them. We need to release them to God. It kind of reminds me of Job from the Bible. Many of you know the story of Job, but Job lost everything. He lost his farm animals. He lost his servants. He lost his children, his family. He even lost his health. He got leprosy. And people were trying to give him advice what to do. And finally, he went to God and he was like, God, what's going on? And God revealed to him and said, this is who I am. I'm the one who created. I'm the one who sustains. And Job realized at that point, he had to surrender his circumstances and give those circumstances to the creator and sustainer of all things. In your life, what do you need to surrender what do you need to surrender? The third thing that I want to say about uh, security, journeying and security is this, that security overcomes challenges. Security overcomes challenges. The psalmist here it says uh, uh, of our passage is no stranger to challenge, no, no stranger to suffering, no stranger to pain. These people, the people of Israel had you know, a fair, their fair share of hardship, right? I mean, just read the Old Testament. As you read the Old Testament, you'll see that they experienced sickness and disease and death and persecution, and oppression, military attack, armed uh, uh, exile, all those different things. They weren't immune to it. But again, the psalmist reminds them what? About evil in their land. What will happen? It will not remain. It will not remain. It will disappear. It's temporal. As we look at our world, we realize that our world is filled with challenges, filled with insecurities, filled with things that create fear in our life. I mean, look at the big international crises that are taking place. Look at our own country and look at kind of the chaos around the elections. Look at, uh, look at our neighborhoods that... They seem so volatile right now, just ready to explode. This, there's this tension that exists over race. I had a 20-something-year-old student uh, this, even this week ask me, he said, uh, Dr. Grins, are, are things, have you ever experienced something like today, you know, with all the conflict and struggles and, and difficulties in our world? Doesn't it seem crazy? Has there been another crazy time in your life? And I had to think and I went, you know what? Yeah. Some of you might remember the 70s. I, I remember the 70s as a kid. And, and I remember, you know, we were coming out of Vietnam War. We were coming, uh, uh, we, we were, there, was, there were terrorists in the UK, car bombs going off on a regular basis. There were planes being uh, blown up in the sky. There, there were, uh, there were uh, Olympic athletes in Munich gunned down. There were, you know, and the list went on and on and on. And I went, you know, I said to the student, you know what, life is always going to have conflict in this world. We live in a world that's, that's broken because of sin. So it's going to be this way. And I think we just know more maybe about it because we have news channels that are 24-7 that just continue to talk about the same event over and over again. Where, you know, we, uh, when I grew up, we had an hour, you know, once a day where we had the news and that was... That was about it, you know. Uh, so I, I want to say that I think we live in a time where there's a lot of fear and insecurities. But knowing that our, our security can be in God's love allows us to understand that we can overcome the challenges, that God has overcome these challenges, that they are temporal, they're, they're fleeting. 
and we can be secure despite these challenges. It reminds me of what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He said this, Therefore, do, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them. So fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Eugene Peterson said it this way, nothing counter to God's justice has an eternity of itself. Nothing counter to God's justice has an eternity. That's good news. That's good news. That brings us security. Like Job, to know that God is constant, but the challenges around us are only temporary. We can be secure in God. Which leads me to the last key that I want to leave you, leave you with. And that's this. Security leads to freedom in life. Security leads to freedom in life. Have you ever been, found yourself where you're always fearful of what's behind you? You know, you're always kind of looking over your shoulder going, like, I, I got to be careful, I'm afraid, and filled with fear. When we have security, we don't have to look over our shoulders out of fear. We don't have to fear what's going on in our nation. We don't have to fear others who are turning their backs on us. We don't have to fear our relationships failing. We don't have to fear our, our jobs failing. We don't have to fear about our salvation and whether or not it's in jeopardy. We don't have to fear because we are secure in who God is, his love for us. We no longer have to worry about people trying to like us. I want to end with a, a little story. The story is of a botanist who was out uh, doing research and he came to this area that was a beautiful area and he saw so many types of flowers that he had never seen before. And as he looked down this gorge, he saw a, a, a flower that he just so wanted to see up close. And he couldn't get it. He couldn't get there because of the gorge. But he saw on the edge of the gorge, he saw this young boy who, who seemed to be just really enjoying the environment, just loving the scenery. And he went up to the young boy and he said, hey, would you help me? Would you help me get that flower that's way down in the gorge? Now here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna tie a rope around you and I'll let you down and you can pick it up and then I'll pull you back up. Well, the young boy looked excited because, you know, hey, that sounds fun. But at the same time, a little bit apprehensive. He said, wait, I'll be back. And so the boy ran off. Not long later, the boy came back and he's with an older gentleman, an older man with him. And he says, I'm ready to go down the gorge to get that flower. You can tie me up in a rope, but that man is going to hold the rope. He's my dad. So he went down, his dad holding the rope, went down, got the flower and pulled it back up. I love that story because it reminds me of something because in, in life, I think sometimes we think we're holding on to God for our security and the reality is he's holding on to us. The reality is not that I have to hold on with dear life to God. The reality is he's holding on to me even in the challenges of life. Even in my own fears, he's holding on to me. This morning, you may be needing to have more security in your life. I want to tell you, it starts by having your full confidence in Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross. That's where it starts. And I pray that you would reach out and say, I want to have trust in Jesus Christ and what he's done for me on the cross. Full confidence. That's where it begins. Some of you are saying, you know what, I've, I, I've, I have that trust. I know my, that I'm forgiven of my sins. I know that I have eternal life, but in this life, I'm struggling with security. Living in God's love and finding that security. I hope the psalmist encourages you today. And I want to leave you with two passages of scripture. 
The first is John chapter 10. Just listen to these words. This is Jesus talking to his followers. Verse 27 to 29. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hands. No one can snatch you out of the Father's hands. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, 38 to 39, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither the height nor the depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. That's security. So people, let's be people who trust in the Lord and are like Mount Zion that cannot be shaken, cannot be moved. Let's realize that God's arms are wrapped around us as the mountains wrap around Jerusalem. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for the fact that you are with us. And it is you that is constant. It is you that is secure. You do not change from day to day. You do not move. And we can trust in you. And in you, we can find love that brings security. And I just pray that each one here would long to find their foundation of security in you. Encourage us by your spirit. Strengthen us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.